My name is Mateusz Pusz. I'm the principal software engineer at IPAM and also a trainer and a consultant. And today we are going to, to talk about a name lookup and the overload resolution. Um, as I told you, I'm, I'm a trainer and I would like to try something new today. Um, I would like to merge somehow the, the form of the, of the lecture and, and the workshop, which I call the workshop style. And we'll see how, how it works. I would like to basically try something new. So uh, I will provide you some rationale. Um, I will try to facilitate some discussion. Uh, by this, I also mean force you to, to, to think. And I will be forcing you to think by doing the AHA slides. Uh, so please scan the code and join through your web page, for your, for your phone or computers. You can either scan it or, or type the URL at the top. Uh, Besides providing you the theory, I will try also to specify the pitfalls and, and corner cases that can happen in production. And I'll try to provide recommendations how to basically uh, avoid them. Uh, typically, you would also be doing lots of coding on the workshops, but here we don't have the possibility for that. But this is um, so we have to skip this part. If someone will be joining later on uh, uh, and we will be continuing with slides, if you could just show the QR code for them from your uh, phone, they would be able to join as well. So I don't have to show this to people that would, that would be late for the, for the, work, for the workshop <laughs> lecture, workshopy thing that we have right now. Um, all right, so basically the rationale. First of all, um, the features we are going to address today are really expensive. Name lookup and the overall resolution are among the most complex and the most expensive at compile time things that compiler does in the C++ language. We often blame templates for slow compilation types, times, but actually often also overload resolution takes a lot of time in our compilation process. So this has a lot of cost. So why did we decide to put such stuff to our language? So why to allow more than one function with the same name? As the Titus Winters said at some point, uh, on, on, I think it was the keynote on CPPCon, that the overload set is the atom of the C++ design. Uh, it allows us to provide terse, robust, and fast interfaces, like these ones, right? And it allows us to do generic programming. We can provide one template function, right? This is uh, this is template in C++20 uh, with one name. Uh, rather than having things like like in the in the object oriented programming that everything is a Bay class of printable type, right? So with that we don't have to deal with with any polymorphism and still have the same name, the same entry point to the to the design to the interface. We can also use operators, which is much more convenient uh, when you are using something that looks like a numeric type. For example, I'm the author of the physical units library. And if I compare solution in C++ to the solutions, for example, in Java, where you have to put add, subtract, multiply for all of the units, it's totally different readability for the user. And also, um, this allows us to provide customization points, right? Like swap or, or, the, or, the, or the streaming operator or other things. All of this is achieved thanks to the fact that we can name several functions with the same name. Uh, this is actually a kind of the polymorphism called ad hoc polymorphism. So basically, function has a different implementation depending on the li limited range of individually specified types and uh, combinations like that. Uh, in the C++ language, we are allowed to, to define several functions with the same name, assuming that basically the, they will have different arguments. By this, I mean different number of arguments or different types of the arguments, if the number is the same, or even the arguments may be the same, but then you have to provide different constraints for them, which is C++ 20 style. And also you may provide different return types. That's not mandatory, and this doesn't make an overload set. So if the arguments are the same and the return types are different, this is just an error. So you are not overloading by return types, but basically you don't have to specify covariant return types like in case of, for example, polymorphism or, or other interfaces. And the compiler will select the best one, matching one during compile time, if possible, of course. Core guidelines. Rule number 162 says that overload operations that are roughly equivalent. 
So we should overload things that basically do the same, do similar stuff, right? So in case print is a good example, uh, if you had something like print int, print based, a print string, uh, will be much harder to work with. And this is what other languages have to deal with. Another rule, overload only for operations that are roughly equivalent, right? Probably you've seen the example with, with lunch, lunch missile and, 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 and lunch other stuff on, on many different talks, so I try to provide something different. Uh, if open and open gate are totally two different things, we don't want to make them the same overload set in the same namespace, right? Of course, they can be both named open, but, but in this case, they, could be, they should be in different namespaces, not even over, as an overload set in the same scope. Because they do different things, and they shouldn't be uh, together in the same place. Because the rule from Google C++ style said that basically use overload functions, only if a reader looking at a call site can get a good idea of what happens with this function call without, look, without actually trying to figure out which of the overloads is being called. If you, if you type print, you want to find to things to be printed. And you don't want to basically reason about which of the overloads will be selected because your behavior will be different. Uh, and you have to account for that in your code. So you want to, to have the same, let's say, side effects uh, for each of the calls. Properties of a good overload set. Correctness can be judged at the call site without knowing which overload is picked, as we mentioned. A single comment can describe the full set. You don't have to specify a comment for each of the overloads because all of them should do the same, right? Only on the different set of arguments. Each element of the set is doing the same thing. Those are the properties that you should have, and if those are true, then you can use the same names. Otherwise, try to use different names for the user to not be confused. For example, pushback as an overload in vector uh, has two or maybe more overloads. This one is for the uh, const reference, value reference. This is for R value reference. If we remove the second one, basically nothing will change in our program. Everything will work the same, only the performance will be a bit different. But from the functional point of view, everything will be the same. Right? This is a good overload set. All right. So this was the rationale why we have to pay for this extremely uh, expensive and hardware set feature. And now let's talk how this feature actually works. And then lookup is the first uh, step of a process of calling a function. In this step, we are looking for all of the names that we can find and provide a list of candidates. Um, after, right after this process, we are calling template argument deduction to deduce the arguments for, for function templates. Then we are doing the overload resolution that we are going to address today as well. Uh, and after that only, we are checking the member access rules. So for example, the private calls cannot be called if you are outside of the class context. Uh, we are also checking function template specializations later on, doing virtual dispatch, and also verify verifying if the function is not explicitly deleted by the user. So this is the process of calling a function, and today we are going to address point one and three only from that. So name lookup. Name lookup is the procedure by which a name, when encountered in a program, is associated with the declaration that introduced it. Um, the result of this process is a list of candidate functions that will be then passed to the overload resolution process to find the best match. We have two kinds of name lookup. One is called qualified name lookup. Another one is called the unqualified name lookup. Qualified name lookup is when the name that appears, that appears on the right-hand side of the scope operator um, is provided. In case uh, there is no scoping operator in, on the left part of the name, it's an unqualified name lookup. Before a qualified name lookup can happen, so you are looking for the name on the right-hand side of the scoping operator, first you have to find something that's on the left-hand side of the operator to know the context where to look for. So first left side, then the right, right side, right? And the left side, again, can be a qualified or unqualified lookup. So in this case, we are doing something a bit crazy. We are creating a structured STD just because we can, right? 
And then if you try to, to call C out on STD, uh, we are going to have a compile time error because the compiler will rightfully say that I found the name STD and I'm looking for C out inside of it and there is no C out inside, right? Because name lookup, unqualified name lookup here for STD finds this STD. In order to find the namespace standard from the IO stream header, you have to prefix it with the, also the, uh, the scoping operator and then it looks for the, for, for the name in the global scope. Notice that in both cases here, C out is looked in a qualified way. So the STD in the first case is unqualified, C out qualified. In the second case, both names are looked in the qualified way. A qualified name may refer to class member, namespace member, and numerator. So basically everything that can provide those semicolons for you, right? If there's nothing on the left-hand side of this scoping operator, we are looking for things in the global namespace or for things that were uh, imported to global namespace with the using directive or declaration. All right, so time for the first quiz. Um, we have such code. We have nested namespaces, my namespace, internal, deep, and two function that looks like an overload, right? Function of integer and function taking a string. And here from the deeply nested namespace, we are calling the function with string argument. All right, if you didn't join yet, please join. Uh, scan the QR code. And I will give you 30 seconds for that. You can also type the address. The address is not visible here, okay. But let's join. Uh, also, you can take the screen from, from your friend that sits next to you. I see the counter growing still. So let's wait a bit more, 28. Also online people, please join us. I could ask for show of hands, but this will basically exclude all you guys that are online right now. So please join us. Let's make some fun here. All right, the counter stopped, 29 people joined, and let's uh, continue. Which function is selected? You have 15 seconds, if I remember correctly. All right, let's see what are the results. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay, so we mostly think that, that there will be a uh, STD string overload code. Uh, eight people claim that it will be integer version and for that will be compile time error. Uh, let's, uh, let's see what the answer is. The answer is compile time error. It's compile time error because the compiler at this point is looking for a string uh, argument uh, in the function func. It checks in the namespace deep for this name. It didn't find anything. So it went up to the, to the parent scope. And in parent scope, the name was already found. And at this point, the lookup stops. I don't mean that at this at point of this function, but at point of the scope. So all of the overloads from the scope visible at this point will be included in the overload set, but the compiler will not go to parent scopes anymore. And basically then trying to call function with the string, we have a compile time error. So we are never going to, to see this, this, this function. It's never added to candidate set. Uh, please open, please keep your uh, AHA slides open. We are going to come back to this later on. So please don't close the page. And let's move. So basically, uh, notice that it was unqualified code, right? Funk was called in an unqualified way. If I'd qualify it, like static my namespace colon colon funk, I would find the function I want to call, right? But in an unqualified code, this is how it works. So basically, unqualified name lookup examines the scopes until it finds at least one declaration of any kind. Does not have to be a function. 
It can be, for example, a variable name as well, uh, with a matching name. At which time, the scopes traversing stops, as I mentioned, right? And no further scopes are examined. So even if there are other functions in the outer namespaces uh, that are visible at this point, should be visible at this point, uh, are defined at this point, basically the compiler doesn't add them to name lookup um, candidate set. So pitfalls. Uh, imagine that you have a large legacy code base with many namespaces, right? And you have those two functions, uh, this, this function. You have test and you have func defined here. And this works for ages, like months, years in your code base. And at some point, a new pull request comes or, or a new branch is being merged, and a new function happened, right? Uh, and this function came here and it basically hijacked your previous code. It adds a new feature totally unrelated to your previous feature that you implemented a few years ago. And right now, the behavior of your program starts to go sideways. Uh, by un typically unrelated change, right? It is really tricky to debug to find out because this may be a totally unrelated feature. And something else starts to behave strangely and notice that in this case, there will be no compile time error, like in the previous case. So previous case was actually the happy case. We had a compile time error that something was broken. Here, everything will just work fine uh, in terms of the compilation process, but may go uh, sideways in terms of the functionality. So this is really, uh, Unconvenient, and that's why, as a recommendation, I would like to say that prevent deep nested namespaces in your, in your project. Of course, use namespaces uh, for your project. You should always be out of the global namespace with all of your definitions, but try to keep it like, 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 like flat. The more you will nest namespaces, the, the, the sooner or later you will have this problem. In large code bases, this is a huge problem. This is C++, not Java, right? We don't want to have many nested namespaces. The same scopic-based lookup rules uh, apply not only to namespaces, but also to classes. So if you have classes, basically the same uh, rules are here. If you're calling on derived type, we are calling func, that's type double. Only this function will be visible, and this one will be hidden. Of course, you can um, import, let's say, this function by using directive here, and then both will be visible and you can have then proper overload set, but you have to do some additional actions in order for the other functions to be un 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 visible here, unhidden. So this is how it works also for, for classes, not only namespaces. All right, so we are calling a function test in namespace N1 and trying to find, find the function that's defined after the call site. Of course, it will not compile, right? Uh, it will find those two in the, in the other namespace, in the parent namespace, and the function that is actually defined in the same namespace will not be found because it's defined after the call site, right? So then lookup in regular functions considers only function candidates visible from its definition context. Um, it's my, it is reasonable, and maybe this slide doesn't have much sense here, but it has, you, I can promise you later on we'll be talking about, about function templates, you will find out that the behavior differs. That's why it's important to say that functions behave differently than function templates in this case. Next thing that is really important here is argument-dependent name lookup uh, with abbreviation ADL, or sometimes also called a Kenic lookup because Andrew Kenic was the one that introduced this to the language. Uh, in this case, we have a structure X that is being defined in namespace N2, and we have a function that takes it as an argument. And you have another unrelated namespace, N1, that takes this argument of N2X and calls a function with, in an unqualified way. Right, and now we are having this instance of X calling n to func directly, and then calling n one test that calls this function indirectly. In both cases, um, the compilation will succeed. The compiler will be able to find a function in unrelated namespace, thanks to the fact that the argument is in namespace n two. If you are passing a function to an unqualified call. 
uh, that has an argument from some different namespaces than the current namespace, the compiler will also include those other namespaces in the lookup of your function name. So it will look not only in, for n1, for a function func, but also in the namespace n2. All right, so now you have a tricky case, two columns, left and right. They have exactly the same code with the only one difference that here we're using struct, my array, that takes a vector inside, and here we're using an alias, my array, that basically points to a vector of integer. We're having a print that takes argument of my array as the first argument, and then we are passing this argument to a function in the outer namespace, and calling print in an unqualified way. What do you think? What will happen with this code? Will the left and right column compile or not, or, and, and if it will work, work correctly? Again, let's move to our slides, and let's see. All right. Let's see the results. Uh, okay, so nearly the same amount of people says that the will be compile time error for left column, that on the right column, that, 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 uh, sorry, that, that it will work as expected. And in case of the right column, there is more people claiming that it will work as expected and there will be compile time errors as well for some of you. Uh, let's see. In this case, the compiler uh, basically provides compile time error on the left-hand column. Right works as expected. Right was as expected because we have a strong type here, my array. My array that's in the namespace A, so with argument dependent name lookup, the function print is being found, and it works as expected. In this case, even though we see the same name here as on the right column, this is not the same, the compiler doesn't see the same. The compiler in this case sees std vector of int because this is just an alias, right? Even though we see my array in the namespace A, this is not what compiler sees, compiler sees std vector and looks for print in the std namespace, which is not found, and that's why we have a compiler error. So basically aliases are fully resolved and expanded to their source types before the list of namespaces to ADL search are chosen, right? So this A doesn't provide uh, the source for lookup in case of an alias. In case of an alias, you are looking for in the namespace of the argument that is aliased rather than its name. All right, another quiz. Uh, right now we are having a structure that defines, in a namespace n2, that defines a friend function that takes the x as an argument. So this is non-member function that is a friend of structure x and takes the x as an argument. And then we're having a different namespace that takes the x from n2 as an argument and calls it in an unqualified way. And now, we are calling n2 func and n1 test. And which one of those will work correctly or fail or maybe not, not, not work as expected? All right, and uh, let's see the results. Hmm. 
All right, so we believe that most of us, that most of the code will just work as expected. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the case. And the problem is that the func is not a member of n2 in this case. The compiler will not be able to call the first function here directly. Uh, as long as the definition of the func and the declaration of it is in the structure x, then it is not officially a part of the n2 namespace. And this case is called a hidden friend. Of course, the other one for ADL will find it correctly and everything will work nice. So friend function publicly declared and defined inside of a class and taking this class type as an argument is called a hidden friend, like here. The important part here is that the definition have to be in the same place where the structure. If you will define this outside of the structure, then this function will be a part of the outer namespace. Because you can declare this as a friend here and then define it outside. Then everything works as, as normally. Right? But if you will provide definition inside of a class, then it's hidden friend, it doesn't participate in the outer namespace, and it can be found and, 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 and called only through the ADL. As a recommendation, um, we recommend using hidden friends wherever possible for functions that have commonly used names. So operator overloading and common customization points. Um, because by the fact that this function doesn't participate in the outer namespaces, it will not be considered as a part of, a, of an overload set for other argument types. So with that, you are shrinking the number of things that compiler has to look for for every call, right? I, Consider if you will be, if you'll be including some uh, or a few uh, headers from the std namespace, how many streaming operators will be there? Uh, and how many uh, other uh, customization points will be provided, like, like less than or whatever, uh, with the, uh, or uh, for example, comparison operators, right? How many of them will be provided? That's why if something fails, you see hundreds of lines of error code stating that I analyzed all of those hundred overloads of operators equals equals, and I couldn't find a good answer to, to, to your code, right? Because all of this hundred had to be found with name lookup and then compared and, 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 and ranked with overload set, or, or the overload resolution process. With the hidden friends, you will eliminate this function from the lookup for other argument types, which makes the compile time faster. This is why we are recommending this. All right, so name lookup from, the, from function templates. This is a template in C++20, right, with auto. And this is a similar case that I shown you before. We have function that is being defined after the call site, right, in N2. We have structure x and the function that takes x, and we also provide another function that takes an integer inside of the, the same namespace after the call site. And we are calling n1 test. It turns out that this one works correctly and this one doesn't. Why is that? Uh, one to three is an integer. Integer in this case is a known type. It's not dependent on the template argument. In this case, even though it's a template, um, we have to basically to bind this at the point of, of call here. We have to know the definition because it doesn't depend on the template argument. It's not dependent. This, in this case, we don't know what v is. Uh, it's, it's dependent parameter with dependent type. And in this case, we will be searching for the function from this place and also from the place of instantiation, which is in this case. And in this case, we see the other definition and everything works as expected. Or maybe correctly, maybe not as expected. Maybe it's surprising to you. But basically, this is how it works. Uh, typical error with, the, with, with this pattern is that people have something in the namespace N2, and then they try to provide a function like, I don't know, less than, serialize, print, or whatever, in their current namespace when they are writing a code. And then there is a question, why the compiler cannot find my function? I overloaded it correctly for example, for the unit test framework to print it on the screen. 
The answer is you have to define it in the same namespace as the argument, otherwise it will not be found. Even if it is in the same namespace that you are calling your code. Right, so if you want to add an overload for, I don't know, std vector of int, how to print it in some framework, you have to open the std namespace and put the print function there, which you shouldn't do. <laughs> but this is the only way to make it work with such frameworks. So what are dependent names? Inside the definition of a template, the meaning of some constructs may differ depending on what is the type or parameter, basically, of the template. So in this case, uh, B of T is dependent name, dependent type. We don't know what is the interface of B of T, what are the members, what, what are the member functions, unless we know what T is. Consider, for example, unique pointer, that depending on the type, if it's an, an, a value or an array type, has a totally different interface, right? So unless, until you know the, the type, you cannot know what is the interface there. Also, we don't know what A is here. It may be a type, it may be a value, it may be a function inside of the T. And there may be actually different T's with different partial specializations that behave differently. So depending on the specialization of T, um, different, um, the, same, the same name may, may mean different things. That's why the compiler cannot decide at this point what is needed. That's why we have to sometimes disambiguate things with type name and template keywords to have the compiler process the code. But the compiler still is not sure what it is. And that's why, in case of dependent names, the lookup is done also from the instantiation place. Name, name lookup and binding are different for dependent names and non-dependent names, as we already have seen, right? Non-dependent names are looked up about at the point of template definition, like we've seen in the case of one, two, three. We had to know the definition at this point. And this holds even if at the point of instantiation, so here, we have a better match. So let's see, we have g of double calling g of one, and we have g of int here. In this case, we always call g of, g of double because this is the only option that is known, because one is not dependent on, dependent on t. But if you call g of one, so the same call, in this context, you call g of int because this is known at this point. This shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you, right? Because this is how regular code, not template code works, right? So, so this is nothing new. But in case of, of the template, actually the g of double will be, will be found at code. Binding of dependent names is postponed until lookup takes place. The lookup of a dependent name used in a template is postponed until template arguments are known. Non-ideal lookup examine fun functions from the place of its code. So basically, uh, if, it's, if it's qualified, for example, lookup, it will just look in the things that it already knows. Only ADA lookup for dependent name will behave like we mentioned. So it can found things also defined later on, but before the place of the specialization instantiation of the, of the template. So it has to be dependent and ADL lookup in order for this to happen. Adding a new function declaration after template definition does not make it visible except via ADL. For the, and taking, of course, depending name as an argument. This is something that we use often, or actually in most of the generic frameworks. Right? Consider a framework called convert header with convert function uh, that has also from string. Right from string is an entry point for the user. It provides string view specified to which type we want to convert stuff. And we are calling convert function that provides here only the default implementation using, for example, string string, right? Really bad implementation, but generic one. And then we have price header that provides a customization point convert for this price. And then we include first convert, so the framework, then we include the price, and then provide from string from one to three to price and everything works as expected, right? Because our price type provided here as a parameter is T, it's a dependent name. So convert sees uh, this definition, that's template, and this definition, that's an exact match. And in this case, uh, this overload wins, and this is why the, this convert uh, customization point works correctly. This is how all of the, custom, custom, all of the frameworks using customization points work in the language. So dependent name and ADL lookup, right? 
I use the unqualified, uh, sorry, uh, unqualified lookup. Yes, unqualified call is used here. All right, so let's summarize what we learned. Uh, let's switch Taha slides. Uh, we are going to um, swap the type, a really powerful and known idiom to many. We are having some really stupid wrapper, and we, we want to provide a swap uh, to this, for this wrapper. Mm. And in this case, we are having stood string as a template parameter, swapping stuff. Which one of the following will work correctly? Swap, unqualified, std swap qualified, and std ranges swap using new facility from C20. Let's see what do you think about it. All right, I think that the time is passed. Uh, so let's see the results. Uh, all right, so we have a lot of votes claiming that the uh, stud swap, uh, stud range swap, would work as expected, uh, which is correct. And most of you claim that swap uh, will not work correctly. Only some of you that it work. Actually, in this case, all of the, case, all, all of the uh, alternatives work correctly, right? Because uh, if you call in an unqualified way, std swap here, it will find uh, the uh, swap defined in the std namespace because std string is provided. And with this, ADL will uh, kick in and look for names in the std namespace. But now let's complicate it a bit. Let's add our own structure, x and provide swap of x. And that prints something on the screen. And the same question, which one will work correctly? By correctly, I mean that we actually will see my swap during execution. Right? All right, let's see the results. Uh, all right, so stood ranges swap, in most cases, work correctly, right? There are some people that think it will not work. Uh, swap in, in the uh, unqualified way will uh, not work, mostly, but it's mixed feelings about this. <laughs> and with two swap, uh, we have the uh, equal distribution here of answers. Let's see. Let's see what is the answer. The answer is that two swap compiles but does not work as expected because two swap will always call two swap uh, um, implementation in the standard namespace, so this will be totally ignored. Whatever you provide as a customization point as your own implementation, it will not be run. If you call it with the, uh, un with the unqualified way, then this one will be, will be found, and std string will be found, so it will work as expected. Stud ranges swap also works as expected here. We are going to talk about stud ranges swap in a minute or two. Because still we have to cover one more case where I added wrapper of integers as the third case here. 
And this is the last case of swapping things. So last quiz. Right, seven, six, five, three, two, one, zero. Oh, <laughs> both here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> All right, so uh, stood range swap works. Uh, stood swap works. We have, it didn't work previously, so right now probably it shouldn't work as well. And, and stood swap uh, mostly works, right? Compared to the, ah, oh, it's hard to point it. Yeah. All right, yeah, like this. Let's see the answer. The answer is basically that swap does not compile at all because it doesn't know how to swap integers. So this will fail. Uh, stood swap does not work, but compile, right? Because this will not be visible. That's why I claim it doesn't work. And stood range swap works as expected for all of the cases. So what we have to do in order to manage and make it work before, uh, before actually we have C++ 20 as stood range swap, because stood range swap was working in all of the cases, right? So it's the best solution ever. But if you don't have C++ 20, what you can do? Who knows? Yes? Yeah, exactly. So the, so the, so the comment is the, that we have to provide using declaration for stood swap. In the scope, we are, we are doing the, the search. And this will make stood swap being visible in the overload set. And still, still we are calling in an unqualified way that allows us to enable ADL lookup and also the fact that they look for dependent names for templates that are defined later on. So this is what you should do for every customization point being run in your code before C++20 customization point objects. Maybe stood, stood, maybe stood swap here is an idiomatic example. Like it is, this example is everywhere on the internet, so maybe you are, you, you are aware of this. But I never, for example, seen anyone doing things like using stood begin and using stood end and then calling begin end on the container in a generic code, right? But this is the right way to do so. Because if you have a container that doesn't have begin and end member functions, but maybe begin and end from the bigger letter because some different naming conventions, or maybe front and end because different naming conventions, they might have customization points provided as non-member functions with the name begin end. And for that, you should provide using std begin, using std end, and call it exactly with the same, the same, the same style in order to have a truly generic code, but no, no one does it, right? Or nearly no one. At least I never did it because I didn't care that that much in order to provide another line in my code, right? If someone doesn't know how, to, how begin name should, begin end should be named in the class, it's his fault, right? Not ours. Just joking, of course, but, 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 but basically this is how we assume. We assume that stood, stood begin, stood end will work. And actually it will not if the container doesn't have those names inside. So, um, custom point object, stood range swap, always works. And actually, you may be surprised, but swap here is not a function. Swap is an object, like the name claims here. Also we have the abbreviation, C uh, CPO here, and also uh, some people refer to it as a nibloid because this was this is what Eric Nibbler um, basically invented in the ranges library. So this is an object. This is a functor defined as a global constant or global variable in the stood ranges namespace. How it is implemented? Let's see. Or maybe how to use it first. A custom user interface entry point 
cannot be found through ADL. You have to always use qualified co in order to find the swap. If you call just swap or range just swap, uh, it may not be found. Range just swap probably will work because it's qualified, but calling just swap will not work. However, the customization point like this can be found only via ADL. So if it's be in the same namespace, for example, it will not be found. Only ADL works, and the same namespace will not work. So the scope lookup is disabled. How to implement this? We are opening to the ranges namespace. We are opening another namespace called swap implementation in this case. And in this namespace, we provide a functor. And then we are providing this, this swap. This is what we call. We call this object. Yeah, we, when you are doing stood ranges swap, actually, this is the object you run. Right? Uh, then we are checking if you have customizations. This uses C plus 20 syntax. You can do it, of course, with the void T uh, before, but it is yeah, it will not fit on the slide. <laughs> it's much harder to understand it and read and, and maintain. So concepts preferred, but it is not C plus plus 20 feature. Actually, it could be C plus plus 11 as well. There is nothing special here. I'm also only using C plus 20 tools in order to make it terse and easy to understand. So we are checking if there is a customization. If you have type T here, and we, we, we verify if this swap can compile. It basically, it's a, it's a valid syntax in the, in the language. So swap T of T should compile fine. And we are doing this with an unqualified lookup, so we are benefiting from the ADL. And now we are writing the call operator of our functor that takes two arguments. And if you have customizations, if context branch, right, this branch is being taken. So we are calling swap because we checked that the swap exists. Otherwise, we are calling the default implementation. So std swap from the uh, std namespace using the qualified lookup to find the std namespace. Yes, question? Uh, the question is why I'm doing all of this instead of two liner. You mean in putting the requires close exactly in here in the if context? Uh, okay, so why, should, why I didn't just use using std swap here? Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, in this case, probably it will work. I, I just make a shortcut here because we probably shouldn't use std swap in this case. We should provide the default implementation right away in this case. So for arrays and for types t, uh, because we don't want the uh, default swap to be actually found in this case, or should we? Uh, let me think why it works like that. Okay, I, I know. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, classification point object uh, should find only things through ADL, never through scope lookup or, the, or for example, in the global namespace. So swap doesn't work like this. If you call, and actually, that's why I said I shouldn't call probably std swap here. Um, as an, mm, mm, or can I? I can call std swap. Okay, first I check in for ADL, and if there is no ADL, I can call the swap, and it should work fine in this case. I'm still, yeah, problem. <laughs> Do you have some opinion on this? I think that there should be a different implementation instead of using stud-swap. I just make a shortcut in the slide. And in this case, it will work as expected. Stud-swap actually will look for other things as well in the global namespace, and it shouldn't. Or not. Ah, all right. Uh, let me think. No, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm right. Stud swap will basically call the, the, the swap implementation, so implementation for arrays and implementation looking for basically doing this uh, free, array, free arguments uh, move on, on, different, on different objects. Uh, so this is, this is correct implementation. However, if I will be doing using std swap and then using swap like before, I will be able to find also everything in the other namespaces, like in the global namespace. If I define something in the global namespace called swap, this will be also part of the, of the lookup process assuming that there is nothing in STD, because in this case, actually, we have STD swap anyway. 
So this is because there, there is one thing lacking here on the slide, and this is the empty space here. We have to we have to kill. We have to we have to we have to uh, basically um, block non-argument dependent lookup. So this scope resolution stuff that we mentioned. We mentioned that if we find some name with the same name uh, that we are looking for, we are not looking in the parenting spaces anymore, right? And this will never be a valid match because it doesn't take any arguments. But it basically is meant in order to block scope resolution. So we only find customization point through ADL. Uh, and with this, uh, we don't have to pay the definition for that because it will never be actually selected, right? It is only, it's called poison pill. It's only actually to block the lookup. So if we will provide here using STD swap and swap, um, and maybe not provide this, this stuff here, then we'll be looking in all of the new spaces and, and, and it will not be that, that easy. Also, um, this is just a generic, I wanted to show you how generic implementation for swap looks like uh, for, for, for the customization point object. It doesn't have to be swap, right? In this case, we have swap in the student namespace. We can somehow benefit from it. But if you are going to implement something by yourself, like serialization object, print, or, or, or printing uh, uh, engine, then this is how you should approach customization points objects. There should be a branch that basically checks if there's a customization, and then call this through IDL only, because this one will block other cases. And then, otherwise, provide a default implementation. As your, this is your engine, there will be no default implementation, so you have to put it basically here. Right? In this case, I try to reuse StudSwap, which may be controversial, as we, <laughs> as we noted. But, but basically, there should be, if there was no, no StudSwap, there we should provide the implementation for, for the array uh, swap and the swap for the, uh, for the type T. And in this case, it will work for all of the kinds. So uh, things in the namespaces, um, so, so STD, current namespace, or the, or the customer namespace, and for the integers, everything are going to work fine. Last thing, I would like to talk about name lookup before we go to overload resolution, and we don't have much time for overload resolution, actually, after this <laughs> discussion. Um, Last aha slides. Which one is being called in this case? We have a primary template, f of f taking t. We have a partial specialization, uh, explicit specialization of this primary template for pointer types, pointer types of integer, and then another primary template for pointer, pointer types. So primary template, specialization, primary template. And we are calling f of int pointer. What do you think? Which one is being called? All right. Uh, let's see the results. <coughs> number two. Um, most people claim number two, and number three is the second choice. So let's see the answer. The answer is number three. Answer is number three because um, in name lookup, we consider only uh, regular functions and, and primary function templates. Those end up in the, in the over, overload uh, set, the, the candidate set for overload resolution. We never consider specialization at this point. So this is a, not a valid, a, a valid um, candidate for the, for the overload set, and it's skipped by the compiler at this point. And then the compiler does the overload resolution, finds the best match. In this case, this one is selected because it is a better match, and then the search is over. If the compiler would select this one in this, in, in this step. Only after this selection, the compiler will be looking for better matching specialization if there is any. But only if, it was one, if that one was already selected in the overload resolution process as the best match. As this was not the case here, number three is being selected. That's why we should avoid uh, specializing uh, function templates. Uh, if you will be lazy, and lazy is often good in C++, and not put template keyword here at all, just make it a regular function, everything could work as expected. I always say to my students during workshops, be lazy. Being lazy is 
the best thing. Don't write your special member functions. The compiler does the correct stuff for you. If, or if you have to, you do equals default instead of writing the implementation. It will be probably better code than you write, and so on. Right? Being lazy often is a good thing in the language. Yes, question? And the, it was a comment or question? Oh. Yeah, so the guideline is to, to not specialize function templates. I think that I told, I, actually this is what I said, right? Yeah? So don't use it, use an overload, regular function. Right? Don't specialize function templates, it's tricky, it's hard to reason about, uh, and it's more to type. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you. One more question? Yes, if we swap the number two and the question is if we swap num the, the second and third line, if it works correctly, yes, then this, this overload will be selected. Uh, this function will be selected because uh, because then the t pointer will be will be selected in the overload resolution process, and int pointer will be probably the better option here, so the compiler will choose it. This is how it works, right? All right. So the next step was about the overload resolution. Uh, we have only three minutes left. But anyway, I sometimes expected that. Uh, overload resolution is a process of selecting the most appropriate overload at compile time uh, based on the uh, candidate state provided by the previous steps. And I would like to direct you to the really great talk from the last year that, were, that the basically Ansel and Barbara were, talk, were, were talking about this for an entire hour. We don't have an entire hour on this, on this subject. So it is really good to, uh, to review that. I have some overview, overview, but having only two minutes, I can just go through two or three slides in order to, to mention what it is about, but probably will not be able to cover all of the grants here. Uh, so go and see this talk. It will explain everything in more detail that I can uh, today, even if we had more time. I will just mention briefly uh, how the overall resolution process works in general. It removes invalid and non-viable candidates from the set. And those non-viable candidates are when there are more parameters in a function. Obviously, it cannot be a valid candidate here. If it has less parameters but, um, and there are no defaulted arguments, then, of course, it cannot be a viable uh, solution for this, for this code. Uh, if something is constrained and the constraints are not satisfied, again, it, it cannot be a, a valid, valid solution. Uh, or the arguments are not implicitly convertible to the types expected by the function. In this case, also, uh, this is not a valid thing, right? You pass a string and, and the function takes in integer. Doesn't work, right? So those are removed from the candidate state from the name lookup, and only the remaining ones are going through the so so-called ranking process that compares um, pairs of each of the, of, of, the, of, of the solutions together. So if you have like, like 10 different functions in overload set, all of them are looked pair by, by pair, so there's explosion of comparisons being done here. That's why it's so slow. And the comparison is done argument by argument, but the ranking stuff. If exactly only one function is better than all of the others, this function is called, otherwise compilation fails. The comparison is compared between two different functions on a pairwise, um, the argument-wise basis. So the first with first argument is object, then the second with second, third with third, and, and the function is being ranked based, based on that. We have several categories of, of, of ranking. Uh, the exact match is the cheapest one. Promotions are more expensive. Conversions are, are deemed to be more, or more expensive. User-defined conversions are nearly the most expensive. And the last one is ellipses, which is the, always the, the, the worst match. And we often benefit from that in some metaprogramming tricks. There's also something called tiebreakers. If both candidates result in the same rank, tiebreaker may be run to find a winner. So for example, if you have two overloads that takes the same, uh, basically uh, both of them have promotions, but, but maybe different a bit, or conversions, but maybe different a bit, there may be defined a tiebreaker. Tiebreakers are things like, for example, less conversion step wins, or binding error value reference to an error, to an error value wins when binding L value reference to R value, or less CVU qualified reference wins, and so on. There is plenty of those tiebreakers defined by the standard, and those are checked if two overloads end up in the same rank.
If tiebreakers can be, um, cannot be applied in such a situation, the call is deemed ambiguous. And with that, I think we are out of time. Um, I really recommend you going to Barbara and Anzel uh, talk uh, because they explain everything in much more detail than even I plan to do this today because they had entire hour last time and this is really nice talk. And yes, are there maybe some last question from the audience before we finish? If you have any questions, we can continue on the break, of course. Uh, I can show you some more stuff if needed. Um, Klaus? Yes. Um, the question is, I mentioned that the namespace should be flat and shallow. Uh, I basically mean the same, mean the same thing, right? Keep them shallow, keep them flat, uh, try to not make many deep, deeply nested namespaces inside. If you are doing that, you may have some issues. If basically, if you're introducing another nested namespace, please try to make sure that, for example, it's totally orthogonal uh, stuff with totally, totally differently named functions, so we will not, not never have collisions like that, right? If you consider it like standard, for example, we have like chrono namespace, uh, probably nothing that is in the chrono will be ever in the STD namespace, right? Because, because of, the, of the feature that is being introduced by this namespace. So there will be no collisions between those. And this is maybe a good solution for that. But uh, please, take, please basically uh, have it in mind that it's a not good practice to do so. And we are also trying to limit number of namespaces in, in standard library. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, it was really a pleasure to provide this talk to you. And see you soon. <laughs>